Hello, everyone. I'm Francois Picard. It's a war and a public relations war ahead of Sunday's presidential election in Russia. Early voting taking place in Moscow occupied Mariupol. The buildup uh, to the vote has been marked by stepped up cross border air and drone attacks from both the Russian and Ukrainian side. Ukraine, which uh, managed for the second day running to uh, target oil refineries inside of Russia. Antonia Kerrigan has more. Tuesday night saw civilians evacuated from this residential building in flames. This in the Ukrainian city of Sumy, as Russia and Ukraine exchanged strikes in their border regions for the second night in a row. It was midnight on the second night. I didn't understand what was happening. It just fell. There was a bang and this is what happened. I'm on the second floor of our flat. We have a small child. How we survived, I don't know. The building and its 15 homes were destroyed in one of several hundred explosions recorded across the Sumy Oblast. While Ukraine continued strikes on oil refineries in Russian border regions, one causing a fire at the Ryazan plant. This, after President Zelensky's rhetoric, grew more aggressive. We will inflict losses on the Russian state in response, quite rightly. They in the Kremlin should get used to the fact that terror does not go unpunished for them. Russia said it also repelled several attempted incursions by Ukrainian-based fighters on Tuesday. President Putin claiming that Ukraine is increasing its attacks to interfere with upcoming Russian elections, escalating his own rhetoric too to talk of nuclear war. From the technical point of view, of course we are ready. And our nuclear triad is more modern than any other triad. Russians will go to the polls this weekend in a presidential election widely regarded as a formality, in which Vladimir Putin is expected to win another six-year term. For more, let's cross now to correspondent Gulliver Craig in Kyiv. Gulliver, uh, that's clearly nuclear sable rattling that we just heard from Vladimir Putin. How are Ukrainians taking it? Well, I think they very much hope that the world has realized by now that you can't take Vladimir Putin's word for anything. And when he says that Russia's nuclear arsenal is more modern than anybody else's or nuclear triad, as he put it, that doesn't mean that that's really the case. Ukrainians have been among the many commentators casting doubt on whether nuclear capacity of Russia is really what uh, the Russians uh, say it is on paper. The level of corruption in Russia means that um, we have seen lots of problems with maintenance of other Russian military equipment, missile launchers backfiring, things like that. Ukrainians, and not only Ukrainians, are thinking and perhaps also hoping that that also applies to Russia's nuclear technology and so it's not as good as it's cracked up to be. The one area where Russia has an advantage, in a sense, in the nuclear um, weapons area is uh, in terms of tactical newts. They've reputedly got a lot more of them than the Americans, perhaps uh, 10 times as uh, many. Those are these sort of smaller nuclear weapons, which are the ones that speculation um, talks about Russia potentially perhaps using. But then the question, will Russia use them? Well, in late 2022 or autumn 2022, Vladimir Putin strongly hinted that it would be a red line for Russia if Russian territory was attacked. And he was talking, making that nuclear saber rattling again back then. That has now happened repeatedly, including today with these attacks deep into Russian territory, onto the Russian oil industry, which is the mainstay of the Russian economy. It doesn't look like any red line's been crossed or that Russia is uh, preparing to launch a nuclear attack anytime soon. The Ukrainians, of course, hope it stays that way. Gulliver Craig reporting live uh, from Kyiv. Uh, many thanks uh, for that update. Uh, they've come from the Ukrainian capital to attend the Paris Defense Forum that was opened by Lithuania's president this Wednesday. Academic and activist uh, Olena Tregub, member of the Ukrainian Defense Ministry's Anti-Corruption Council, NACO. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, Maria Berlinska, chair of the Victory Drones Project. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. You just heard uh, our correspondent uh, alluding to uh, what we've, what's uh, just happened. Second day running where there have been these drones going a long way into, uh, you, into Russia, uh, targeting uh, oil uh, refineries. 
uh, this time uh, the, in the Ryazan region, that's 200 kilometers southeast of Moscow, two days running. Why? Because it's the only one way to, uh, to stop uh, very serious enemies, to destroy their oil bases, their military bases, and uh, that's why we are using different solutions to, uh, to have advantage. And uh, we see that as of now, uh, we are observing the biggest war of technologies and the biggest war of drones in the world. In 2020, when there was the war between in for Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, people were stunned to see how uh, uh, Azerbaijan had huge gains on the battlefield thanks to drone warfare. Vladimir Putin makes his play for Kiev in 2022. What's changed since then in the fact that now you're able to hit these refineries this long way away? A lot of changes. And first of all, as I said, that we are observing the biggest war of drones and technologies and uh, a huge uh, advantages by technologies that uh, we can get from, um, from our engineers and our volunteers who dedicated to this work. How come the jamming doesn't work by the Russians? You know, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's uh, a, st a huge mistake to underestimate our enemies because Russians, they have li really prominent engineers. And uh, the Russian jamming, the Russian radio electronic warfare, uh, the best in the world. That's why I'm here to, you know, to pay attention uh, to your stakeholders and decision makers and... Uh, to deliver the message that it's very important to be well prepared. To, it's very important to not to underestimate potential enemies, uh, but to develop your own technologies. And we are more than ready to share all our uh, findings, all our lessons learned from the battlefield. And uh, uh, it's not about only radio electronic warfare, it's as well about automatical and optical systems of uh, navigation and uh, targeting. So that's uh, one of the ways you, you don't use the, cl the classic GPS systems to, to guide them in... Uh... GPS, GPS, no, you can... Uh, forget <laughs> about GPS. Yeah, yeah, just forget for Maria about... Berlinska, tell us what the Victory Drones Project <clears throat> actually is, You're, because drones are effectively for commercial use, sir, right? They're for... Uh, uh, taking nice pictures with your GoPro. <laughs> you know, uh, what we can see now is that uh, drones is, uh, absolute, are highly effective weapons against, uh, against uh, Russian weapons, and you can uh, destroy, for example, Russian tanks that cost $2 million by drones that cost uh, $400, by FPV drones, for example. It's and the 21st century equivalent of a Molotov cocktail. Uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a relevant, uh, relevant uh, maybe, yeah, uh, <clears throat> uh, some, um, some people think that uh, it's just toys. And very often, even uh, um, top generals and uh, officers uh, said uh, eight years ago or five years ago, it's just toys. But, but you make it sound that way. You talk about kitchen drones because people uh, assemble them, are encouraged to assemble them in their kitchens, and then your, your organization trains officers how to basically use their joystick, right? What we are doing uh, uh, in Victory Drones and uh, our, uh, the biggest uh, fund of uh, technological um, advantage uh, and technological development, uh, Dignitas Fund. Why Dignitas? Because revolution of dignity. That time uh, our long journey started. And uh, what we are doing, we are working uh, with causes, not consequences. But because everything at the war divided into causes and consequences. Let me give you one uh, simple example. Uh, when Russian tank came into the positions, uh, and um, this tank can destroy and kill a lot of people. Tank cost just two or three million dollars, but consequences will be in amount of uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. So uh, we would like not to work with consequences, but with causes. We teach people how to destroy these tanks by drones, and we teach people how to assemble drones. And as of now, we have um, 
a huge results because uh, we trained more than 56,000 people, uh, military people, uh, how to use drones and ecosystem of technologies. As of now, we created comprehensive online theoretical course and more than 100,000 people registered for this course. As well, we uh, created two more courses, how to assemble drones. So uh, we believe in um, technological militarization of Ukrainian society because, you know, we can't uh, create F-16s or HIMARSs in weeks or even months. But what we can do, we can um, beat a more serious enemy. We can beat Putin by technologies. The technologies which uh, both sides have, uh, Elena Tregub, we've uh, talked enough about uh, Iran's uh, kamikaze drones that have been used uh, on, on the battlefield. How does it work? Because in, in, in a drone, just like in any household appliance, uh, there are pieces uh, uh, that both sides have access to, uh, components that come from all over the world, from the West, from China, from Russia. Yes, exactly. And uh, as Maria pointed out, uh, this war, it's a chase of uh, technology. And uh, the, what Ukrainians are asking for, they are not just asking for, like, in haste cooperation with the West, uh, for military assistance, but we also ask uh, to help us uh, winning this chase by uh, delaying the production of the Russian war machine because Russia has effectively militarized its own economy. Uh, Russia is, is producing millions of, of those uh, drones uh, now uh, using Iranian technology, uh, buying from them. So um, it's, a, it's a huge issue. And of course, Russia relies on uh, Western technology uh, in Shahed uh, Kamikaze drone, in uh, Mohajer uh, drone, which are made by Iran. Uh, for Russia, 90% um, of uh, critical technology is from the West, mainly United States, but also European countries. And even if there are sanctions, it's impossible to stop that? I think it is possible, but I think uh, not enough is being uh, done by governments. Governments do not uh, really devote enough attention to this. We discuss even today in Paris uh, with uh, your experts on uh, export control. What are the possible solutions? What should we offer, for example, to Washington, uh, to Paris? What can be done? Because uh, it's now uh, full of loopholes, and now Russia keeps buying all they need for their weapon, unfortunately, two years after full-scale Again, I ask the question if it's impossible because what these use microprocessors used even in regular household appliances. You can take them out of a household appliance and build a drone with that. Uh, that well, that's right. But uh, th those uh, microprocessors that they need, for example, for uh, very uh, complicated missiles, uh, for planes, uh, those are uh, higher level processors which are not used for household appliances and you cannot replace them. Some uh, processors can be replaced, but still, uh, I'm just telling you, they are using dual-use technology, which is a higher-level technology from Western countries. And uh, the, the, there is now Russia created the whole uh, machine, uh, their, uh, like, you know, uh, group of people around the world who are um, procuring for Russia what Russia needs to make weapons. And this machine is working pretty fine. So 775 kilometers away from Ukraine's border is that refinery uh, in uh, Nizhny Novgorod mm -hmm. uh, that was hit on Tuesday, severely damaged. What, what do you make of that? What, what's, the, what, what's, the, what's the consequence of that? What, what conclusions do you draw from that? Well, uh, I draw from that that uh, Ukrainian uh, society is very innovative in terms of uh, how we now uh, boosted our own uh, domestic infrastructure uh, of manufacturing of and innovation of those uh, drones. And uh, in Ukraine, it didn't come really from the state. It came originally uh, from society, from grassroots, when different startups, different people came up with ideas uh, who will make uh, the best drone. Ma Maria mm. knows how many... Uh, companies we have in Ukraine that make drones. It's As of now? Yeah. Hundreds, yeah. Hundreds. Hundreds companies, hundreds little companies make drones. And uh, so uh, now they made these successful drones. But uh, again, to your question, why Russian um, electronic warfare didn't work? Today it didn't work, but tomorrow it might work. And it means that our uh, people should make a, a different kind of drone, a different kind of modification that would be prepared. 
So it's, it's a chase. It's a chase on both sides. One quick final word on this. Uh, you, you put an estimate in, on what? You need something like four and a half million drones a year if this war is going to continue? Uh, yeah, and much more. Because uh, if we are talking about drones as uh, kamikaze drones, it's like uh, ammunition, you know? It's like uh, uh, you, you can shoot day by day and you can spend more than 10,000 per day. And that brings us to what Elena Tregub was saying about how uh, we're in a wartime economy on the Russian side. The Czech Republic uh, this uh, Wednesday announcing that it'll be the month of June when that uh, procurement effort uh, for, by the European Union for more ammunition will come uh, to fruition. We have breaking news when it comes uh, to uh, the EU's war effort. Uh, it has uh, greenlighted a 5 billion uh, euro military aid package uh, for Ukraine that's being hailed by authorities uh, in Kyiv after the announcement of a summit to uh, hash out differences over how far people should go. Uh, the uh, French, the Germans, uh, and there you see the French uh, debating in front of the Senate, a, a motion that was approved overwhelmingly by the lower chamber on Tuesday of uh, support for the government's uh, policy uh, in favor of uh, Ukraine. Uh, there's going to be a, a summit on Friday uh, between the leaders of France, Germany and Poland. And uh, this Wednesday we saw a heated debate in the Bundestag again over how far Germany should go in supplying weapons to Ukraine. Chancellor Olaf Scholz again resisting calls to provide long-range Taurus missiles. We are talking about a far-reaching weapon for range of up to 500 kilometers. And it's a weapon where I believe it's irresponsible to make it available without the participation of German soldiers. That's my very clear position. I repeatedly stated, and I will repeat it again here. The German Chancellor worried Olena Tregub about mission creep. That, uh, you know, we're talking on the day, and we talked about it at the outset, uh, Vladimir Putin again doing nuclear saber yeah. rattling. Worried that... Uh, the Tauruses mean that the Germans will be uh, in direct confrontation with Russia. What, what, what do you say to that? Well, I think that it means that uh, Putin's uh, strategy is very effective on Germany right now because Putin is able now to deter Germany from uh, providing uh, uh, adequate assistance to Ukraine by those nuclear threats. And uh, he, his idea is that, uh, you know, uh, it's been like this from the very start of the full-scale invasion. But He's do been you doing take, this. Do you take Olaf Scholz's argument that if you're going to deploy those Taurus missiles, they're going to have to come with German officers who will be on the front lines? I don't understand that. Uh, we have uh, long-range missiles from the uh, other countries, and uh, our country has been responsible. Uh, we, uh, we were not using those missiles to hit uh, Russian territory. Drones, how much can they help with? Why would you need, at this point in time, what will F-16s, for instance, bring that drones can't? <laughs> you know, uh, if you are going to open the NATO doctrine, you will see that uh, the, one of the main points is that you, before starting planning any serious operations, you have to have air superiority. And uh, as of now, Ukrainians, we haven't even air parity. So uh, it's not, uh, we are not talking that drones instead of F-16s or F-16s instead of artillery. It's, uh, we have to have all this all together as one orchestra because uh, uh, the challenge is uh, highly serious and uh, we are fighting not only against uh, uh, Russian capacities, but as well, uh, we see a lot of, again, components from China, a lot of ammunition from North Korea, a lot of drones from Iran. And uh, unfortunately, as well, we see neighboring uh, French components, Canadian components together in, in uh, Russian rockets, in Russian missiles, together neighboring with uh, components from Iran or China, uh, because uh, mm. we have failed in sanctions issues. Uh, that's why my main message here, uh, that's why I'm here, first of all, to say thank you all uh, people, uh, all uh, people uh, of France, to all your support, to all your uh, support during these dark times. 
And the second, the second point, my message to Western politicians. Uh, you know, recently uh, I have been invited to the Danish uh, parliament, and I asked their politicians what you will do if Russia will attack, for example, a small Estonian or Polish village by drones, by a swarm of drones. You, uh, would you like to, um, to answer by nukes? Or it, it's not going to be uh, boots on the ground or Russian tanks, but a swarm of drones. And Russians, as of now, they uh, improve their technologies. And as of now, they have technologies that um, uh, they, they are able to, for example, to do reconnaissance uh, about uh, German, Germany uh, military bases and so on. So uh, sooner or later, Russia will attack uh, European countries. And uh, Ukraine, uh, we, we were first, but uh, later, and our soldiers as of now, gaining time for all Europe, for all our European family. Right. So my message for Western politicians is very simple. <laughs> Please don't waste fucking time. All right. And uh, right now, uh, Russia is not attacking uh, uh, NATO countries, but they are attacking uh, uh, ex uh, their political opponents inside of them. That's at least what an exiled associate of the late Alexei Navalny says. He blames what he calls Vladimir Putin's henchmen for the Tuesday hammer attack that he suffered as he arrived home by car to his residence in Lithuania's capital, Vilnius. Karis Garland has more on that. Outside the home of Leonid Volkov, Lithuanian police search for evidence. According to his spokesperson, the Russian opposition figure was sprayed with tear gas and beaten with a hammer on Tuesday night. After being discharged from hospital, Volkov posted this video to Telegram, saying he would not give up his struggle against Russian President Vladimir Putin. Earlier, his wife posted these photos on X, showing the extent of his injuries. Volkov is one of Russia's most prominent opposition figures and worked closely with Alexei Navalny, who died in an Arctic prison less than a month ago. Hours before the alleged assault, Volkov gave an interview and spoke of the dangers for Navalny's team. Our work is full of very complicated challenges, of enormous pressure, of high individual risks for everyone in, uh, in the leadership of the organization, because we know that Putin does not only kill people inside Russia, he also kills people outside Russia. The incident comes days before Russian elections that are set to extend Putin's rule. Navalny had urged supporters to flock to the polls at noon on Sunday to demonstrate discontent with the Kremlin. The Lithuanian foreign minister condemned Volkov's alleged beating in a social media post. The country is home to many Russian exiles and has been a staunch supporter of Ukraine throughout the war with Russia. Volkov went into exile in 2019 after authorities in Moscow launched a criminal probe into Navalny's anti-corruption foundation. Two years later, Moscow issued a warrant for Volkov's arrest. And with us is our chief international affairs editor, uh, Douglas Herbert from our international affairs desk. Francois. Doug, uh, this attack, a reminder that uh, before he died in that Arctic penal colony, Alexei Navalny had called on his supporters to go to the polls on Sunday and vote for whoever is best poised to defeat candidates opposed to Putin. Yeah, and not just to go to the polls, but to go at a specific time, at noon, uh, because it's, you cannot basically protest. There's no room for political dissent in Russia today. You face fines, arrests, or worse. Uh, so the idea being show up at the polls en masse on noon. Supposedly, they can arrest you, but it is a way of at least registering your opposition. Uh, you know, yeah, there are a, a slew of candidates technically on the ballot. They're all token opposition. They're there to, end, to, to lend a veneer of legitimacy uh, to this election. Uh, they're basically doing Putin's bidding because they do not, on, on, in reality, they do not actually oppose Putin in any way. The only real candidates who spoke out against the war, who opposed Putin, they were disqualified. Why? Well, not because they spoke out against the war. On technical grounds, there were flaws mm. in their applications. And the, he, nonetheless, he still call, he had called Navalny on people to go ahead and vote for those token candidates uh, anyway. He did call for them to vote for the token candidates just because, like I said, there's no 
uncommitted uh, choice on the ballot. There's no other real opposition. So it's a way of registering some, uh, anyone but Putin being the idea. The problem with that is the Kremlin actually loves having those token candidates on the ballot. Why? Altogether, they might get anywhere from 10, 15, maybe a little more percent of the vote. Thing is, Putin will get about 80 to 85 percent, maybe a little lower, maybe a little more, but around there. But at least he'll be able to say, you know, this is not like a Stalin-era election. At least, you know, there were other candidates, and I overwhelmingly, resoundingly won uh, the popular vote. Maria Belinska, what are your thoughts about this election? What's, what's this about? Uh, well, it's to continue the rule of Putin, uh, just uh, a tool to legitimize uh, the continuation. Everybody in Russia, it's like uh, electing a Tsar. They know he'll be elected, but still uh, they want to be more modern, probably, to external world. Uh, but I think uh, if he canceled the elections and the external world wouldn't uh, have any opinion, I don't think that Russian public would be able to do anything just because... You know, uh, Russian society, unfortunately, now is a totalitarian state, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's only the defeat of Russia which can uh, have give them chance for some transformation. Otherwise, if they uh, defeat Ukraine, it will become even worse, and they will become even more dangerous country. I was just going to say, you know, Yulia Navalnaya has actually, you know, called on uh, the international community not to recognize the outcome of this election, yeah. to actually go on the record internationally saying this is essentially a sham that is a mm. rigged, a staged election, and that the results, uh, the expected result being Putin's resounding win, should not be recognized. Simple. Mm. End of story. Douglas Herbert, I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, both uh, Elena Tregub and Maria Berlinska for taking the time and uh, uh, stopping in to see us. The more important question that uh, after these elections, if Russian politicians will be in negotiations with unlegal President Putin. And the, I, I the, hope no. Right. You heard those remarks by the Pope in the last few days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Uh, again, thanks for all people that support Ukraine and Ukrainians, because it's very hard time for us, horrible times. But uh, at the same time, I can promise you, uh, as a Ukrainian veteran, as a Ukrainian volunteer, that we will beat Putin together. Together we stand, divided we fall. All right, Maria Berlinska, I want to thank you. I want to thank Elena Tregub. Stay with us. There's much more to come here on France 24.